Hey, welcome everyone. Um, our final week, you almost survived my rifle. Um, and essentially, we are going to wrap up the story about knots. Let me just briefly comment on the upcoming quiz and the exam. So, um, the quiz is due 1st of November, and you really need to do it 1st of November. There's no second chance or anything, and you need to do it in like, like a 50 minute, uh, well, just in 50 minutes. So please try to remember that. There's a test quiz online that you can find on Ed, uh, sorry, on Ed, yes, and on Canvas as well, which is like 90% the original, the, the quiz itself, so please do that before, just to get a, to get a feeling what, what the quiz will be all about. So the quiz itself is about graphs and surfaces. And then we will have the exam. And the exam will be about our three topics. Just a reminder for, for you, the three topics. Well, we'll see one in a second again. This is not um, graphs and surfaces. Roughly spread 35% graphs, 35% knots, and 30% surfaces, because surfaces were a little bit overrepresented in the assignment and um, in, the, in the test, because they just come up exactly when the assignment and the test come up. So there will be one fewer question on surfaces, in case you wonder, and there's a test exam online, uh, sorry, yeah, exactly, a mock exam online that I really recommend doing. So um, let's just say I took the original exam and just changed the questions a little bit. So j just, just please, please do it. And otherwise, next week, right, so this is the 12th week, so, but we still have lectures next week, which is just recollections, there's one on Monday, for geometry, um, which Milena will be doing, and I will do the recollection for topology on um, Thursday. And I'm kind of trying to wrap up what we have seen, maybe explain it slightly differently, uh, so hopefully it will be reasonably useful. So if you have any question about those, just, just let me know. But in, in general, hopefully everyone uh, will be doing fine. Okay, so um, let me just run our last, uh, last topic, so we are going to study those embeddings of strings in, uh, in three space, and they're really three dimensional, so they're, some are, so they're one dimensional, but they sit in three space, and we always ask those questions, are those guys the same, are they different? Uh, exactly the same question that we ask for surfaces. Um, so here's an example, and um, yeah, we'll see today that actually it gets a bit more tricky, so I'll comment on that when we get there, but essentially what we need to do is there's some mess on the left and there's some mess on the right, and we kind of want to decide uh, whether they are the same, and we had this sequence of moves that I will pull up in a second, um, which kind of lets us combinatorially decide how that works, but we can see them here in practice. Uh, so there are those three moves that I call R1, 2, 3, so named after the person who discovered them, um, Reitmeister. So they're just those moves. I will pull them up in a second, and you can just massage the knot using those moves until um, you get to whatever kind of other projection you have. And that's kind of the idea. So you only ever need to work um, on those projections. So and eventually, um, actually, these two were the same, right? And we need some, some good tools to decide uh, whether they are the same. So we'll pl roughly play the same game S for surfaces. That's kind of the main idea. Um, where's my cursor? Here's my cursor. Okay. So, and we usually end up with kind of tricky things. So knots are, I really like them. They're kind of beautiful, um, but they turn out to be kind of tricky, tricky objects, way more difficult than surfaces in some sense. We'll see that. For example, the first one is a picture of the unknot. So it's, it's so last year, I had a slightly easier version of that picture in, in the exam, so which was already a little bit simplified, and I was asking the question whether people can see whether that this is the unknot, so I kind of recommend trying to do this. So it's kind of a nice visual exercise. The, the top actually is the unknot. And the point is, we want some machinery that tells us in, instead of just staring at the picture and trying to simplify it. Okay, we want to ask some questions. Are not k and k prime equivalent, um, and we'll have several of those questions in, in, in the tests and the, in, in the exam, for example. So this is usually very tricky. So if you really try it on the on the not k top, let me call it k top. I should have given it a different name. 
k top, then it will take you a while to get there. It's not quite obvious why this should be the unknot. As a reminder, I draw the unknot next to it. It's just a circle. Uh, so we want some tools to actually do that. And I showed you last time already um, a nice tool that was this coloring, and we will explore several uh, similar features, well, this time. So remember that those are the moves that always get us there. So bar one, two, three, and the kind of the isotopy, which I call uh, R0. So these are the equivalents of the diagrams that I always show you. And uh, the one invariant we had was this coloring. Um, so we want to color strings to kind of ignore the left column. Kind of the, if you color them with one color, you could, well, it's like not coloring them at all. Um, but here on the right column, at every crossing, you always see three colors. Um, my colors are green, blue, and red. And that's what calls the three coloring. And the three coloring is an invariant of the knot, like the OLA characteristic is an invariant of a surface. So if you find a non-trivial three coloring, then you, then you can say the knot is not, not the unknot. So this knot here is uh, not the unknot. And it turns out it has nine of those three colorings. So six non-trivial ones, the interesting ones, and the three monochromatic colorings. OK, and we are trying to explore that um, more and more kind of finer invariants, better invariants as we go along. Turns out the Euler characteristic in this case is not quite what we want, but we'll see something similar, uh, not today, but, but later. Okay, but let's repeat something we have seen. Um, the hash product. So connected sum was, was this guy here. I always called it the hash product. So we can do a hash product for knots as well, which gives us a multiplication on knots. And actually, it turns out it's a bit nicer. So we really now get a prime factorization in like a similar way. And then you can kind of do it uh, for prime knots, very similar as we did it for surfaces. And the idea is the same. Remember when I had a surface, I just put it here, and I just put another one here, S and T. And then there's only one reasonable operation you could do. You connect them by a cylinder. Now, everything is one dimension lower. So a cylinder is just a pair of strings. So the only thing I will do is I will um, take the picture like this and replace this one by this one, which is really just a cylinder operation. You can just think of, I connect those two strings. Yeah. And that's the hash operation on knots. We'll see you several, show you several examples uh, as we go along, but it's really just the same. So k hash L is just take a little piece of string from k, take a little piece of string from L, and just connect them together by changing um, the horizontal one into the vertical one, if you want. And of course, this one should be the vertical one, and this one should be the horizontal one. OK, and that's this hash. And it's, it's, it has the same symbol as for surfaces, because it is the same operation, just somehow uh, four nodes. Hope that makes some sense, right? For surfaces, we just put a, a little annulus between them. And for nodes, we just do this uh, reconnection operation. And I show you that this does not depend on, on anything, actually. And it has the same properties as for, uh, as for surfaces. And the, the proof is pretty, pretty cute. Um, and we again think of it as being a multiplication. It's usually called a, a connected sum. So some people think of it as an addition. But um, there will be prime numbers or prime knots. So I really like to think of this as kind of a multiplication on the set of knots. And it's really the same. Uh, type of operation. OK. The unit for surfaces, remember surface hash sphere was, maybe I should call my surface actually t, and it's kind of more obvious. Uh, so surface hash sphere was always the surface I started with. So the unit operation for hash was the sphere. And what is the unit operation for the not hash? It's the unknot. So if we hash anything to a knot, then you get the unknot. I can draw a picture for you. So here's some knot, whatever it is, crazy something, doesn't matter. Here's my little unknot. So I hash them together by just connecting them like this. Yeah? And then I can just pull in uh, the, little, the little beast down here. It's really similar um, to what we have done for surfaces. One dimension lower. In some sense, it's a bit easier. 
it's also commutative. So k hash l is l hash k. Well, essentially, you just take this picture and turn your head around, just turn it 180 degrees, and you will see that k hash l is the same as l hash k. And you just turn, turn your head if you want, if you don't want to turn the picture. Um, this one is also not all that difficult to prove. Uh, essentially, you have a knot here, you have a knot here, and you have another knot here, and whether you connect them first here, and then here, and bracket like this, or you bracket the other way around, uh, doesn't make any, any difference. So it's a really nice operation, because essentially the same as for surfaces, really beautiful, and uh, like a multiplication on knots. So obviously we want to somewhat explore this operation. Cool. So here are some examples. So if you take J and K, well now it's J, whatever, J and K and you hash them together, you get the knot on the other side. If you hash the unknot to K, you can just pull it in, you just pull in this beast here, what is a good color, you just pull in this little thing, just pull it in, and you get the knot itself. And it doesn't matter, this is kind of a nice argument, a nice pictorial argument, it doesn't matter where you do the hash, because just assume that you do it somewhere, uh, let's say here, and you just shrink your knot, make it very tiny, move it around the other knot, and you can pull it out anywhere you want. So doing a hash here is the same as doing the hash here, or doing the hash uh, anywhere you want. So it doesn't matter, so you can just do it anywhere. Yeah. I just shrink the knot, move it around the other knot, and pull it out at some different, different place. I can do that with the left knot or the right knot. Okay, I hope that makes some sense. So there's this really beautiful operation, which is like a multiplication, commutative, associative, or well-defined, it doesn't matter where you do it. It's kind of very, very nice. And let me tell you already something that happens, um, and we, are we just do this very, very slowly, um, then we can try to understand whether we actually get a good grip what those numbers are. So three colorings will be important. Um, so the number of three colorings, that was C3. So C3 is the number of three colorings. C3 is the number of three colorings. Okay. So the number of three colorings of a hash is the product up to a factor one over three. We'll see in a second where the factor one over three comes from. So if whatever, if k has 10 and l has 12, then I should have been more careful because I can't multiply those numbers. But anyway, you get 1 over 3 times uh, 10 times 12, whatever that is. 40 maybe, possible. Okay, so it's kind of a very nice formula. And I'll show you how that works. It's actually quite nice. So we need to count colorings, that's, that's what it's all about. And we kind of know, we kind of assume that we know the colorings for k and for l and you count them for k hash l. And how can we do this? Well, we just draw our little, little pictures here. Huh? So we have k, and k has, well, C3k colorings, let's say blue ones. Um, L has 33L colorings, well, green colorings. Okay. Now we connect them together, okay. and we can just say that we take the colorings of k. Okay, k has some coloring, so take it for k, and it will have some color on the original string, yeah? and I assume it is blue, why not? So this string is actually, let's say, blue colored, because I fix the coloring on K. Then those strings are blue colored, and they push over to L. Okay. And then, well, these are fixed by K. Yeah? But L has uh, this number of colorings, let me get rid of the 1 over 3 for a second, has this number of colorings, so the knot now has the product, because I can color it on the left-hand side with the colorings of K, I can color it on the right-hand side with the colorings of L. But I made one counting mistake, because I already fixed one of the strings in L with one color, so I need to divide the number I get by 1 over 3, because I already fixed one of them. Hope that makes some sense. So you just get uh, the product of those numbers. Okay, let's do it again. We have colorings on the left, we have colorings on the right. We fix the colorings on the left, why not? And then we can push over the coloring to the other side, 
and can still color it with the colorings on the, on the right. Up to one, one point, we already fixed the color on one string, so we need to divide by one over three, because we already fixed one of the colors. So we get um, this nice formula for the number of colorings. So the hash is always kind of behaves like a multiplication uh, for the number of colorings. Almost you do need to divide by uh, three. Oh, well, that's fine. Okay, we divide by three. That's, that's, that's totally fine. Okay. Well, that's interesting, but why is this really interesting? So now we can show it wasn't clear up to this point. It wasn't clear up to this point that there are infinitely many inequivalent knots. Why we haven't, have not addressed this, but we can now show this. And it's actually a pretty beautiful argument. Okay, so keep this formula in mind. So the number of colorings of the hash is determined by the number of colorings on the other side. Cool. So let's do the following. We just take the trefoil and I pull up the picture again. The trefoil had nine three colorings. Here they are. The boring ones and the non-boring ones, six of them. Okay, we have nine of them. Three times three. Hopefully you can see that they are nine. Okay, we have nine of them. Um, cool. And so the trefoil is not trivial because nine is bigger than three. Fine. We already knew that. That's fine. Good. But now we can take the hash of the trefoil, right? Let's just do it once. So what is the number of colorings of trefoil hash trefoil? Well, it is um, 1 over 3 times 9 times 9, which is something like 27. That's not 9. That's bigger than 9. So the, 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 the hash of a trefoil with itself can't be the trefoil. Then you get 27. And now you can do it three times, and you get an even bigger number. And you can do it four times, and you get an even bigger number. You can do it k times, and you get an even bigger number. So I just did the calculation here. So if you do it k times, and I hope I haven't messed up, you get uh, this number, 3 to the k plus 1. So I did it twice, and I got 27. So 3 to the... <laughs> the cube of 3 is 27. I do it four times, I get whatever 27 times 3 is. I uh, probably should be able to do that calculation, but let me not. Let me just say it's 3 to the 4. Um, and then if you do it k times, you get whatever this number. So you have the sequence of different knots, of knots, sorry, sequence of knots, just the hashes, and they spit out more and more colorings. But they're all inequivalent. They're all different. So we found a sequence of knots. They're all different. Is it some, I hope that's somewhat clear, right? So um, they have more and more colorings. Coloring is an invariant, so if the knots would be equivalent, the colorings would be equivalent. But we get bigger and bigger numbers, so we found actually infinitely many knots. Using this not so bad proposition, this was pretty easy. Okay. So just it's just a product of the um, of the colorings. So. If you have a knot that is three colorable, you can just do the same operation. I, I could have taken any knot, essentially. And uh, the different hashes uh, will be all uh, uh, not the same. Just by that formula, you pick up more and more colorings. They always multiply. It gets bigger and bigger. And yeah, whatever. They're all not equivalent. In particular, we found infinitely many. Huh? So there are infinitely many different knots. I hope that was reasonably clear. Yeah, and now we do the ob obvious thing, like it's a multiplication. So we call it a composite if it has a factorization, and we call it prime if it doesn't. Right? Like composite number, prime number, exactly the same, just for the hash. So what is a factorization? A factorization is the L hash M, where neither of them is, are the unknot. And if you think of what is a factorization of a number, whatever, 10 is 2 times 5, so you want a factorization where neither 2 nor 5 are 1, right? So otherwise you could just write 10 is 1 times 10. So these are guys are called composite. Uh, like 10 is a composite number, uh, those guys are called composite knots. And kind of the opposite are the prime knots, like the prime numbers. Okay, hope, I hope that's reasonably clear. So exactly the same terminology as for uh, 
what is it, for numbers. Prime not composite not. Prime number, composite number. Cool. So this not, for example, is a composite because it's a hash of those two. And I just hashed, oh, so where did I hash? I hash he hashed here. So this little picture here is this little picture here put together. So this is a composite knot, and it's made out of two different uh, knots. We'll turn out that those two are actually prime knots. But right now, we don't know that. Okay, so this is a composite knot. Okay. But it's somehow kind of difficult to tell um, whether a knot is... So it's really like with a prime number factorization. If you have a really large number and you want to find its prime factors, that's not quite trivial. And if you have a really large, large knot and you want to find its prime factors, um, it's, it's not a really easy task. So I recommend usually not to do it. But kind of abstractly from the point of view of that the hash is mimicking multiplication, it kind of totally makes sense to talk about prime numbers, pr prime knots, and uh, composite knots. Right. But by the way, we haven't, we haven't seen, for example, that the figure eight knot, which is this one here, let me just mark it, figure eight is this guy here. We haven't seen that this is not the unknot yet. So it could be the unknot, it's not. Let me, just, let me just say it's not. But a priori, we don't know that. We will, but right now we, we don't. Okay. Okay, so all of this was about this funny hash sum, which hopefully is not too difficult now since we have done this kind of the more difficult version for surfaces, right? And it's really like a multiplication now. I will state a prime factorization like in 10 minutes or so. It's really like a multiplication and there are primes and composite numbers. There are prime numbers and prime knots. I hope that was reasonably clear. Okay, before we go back to the hash operation, let's just have another definition. Um, just counting the number of crossings, that's the crossing number of a knot. Okay, um, the crossing number of a projection. And the crossing number of a knot is the minimal possible number that you ever count. Okay. Crossing number, and I denote it by cross. It's exactly what you think, you count crossings. The crossing number of the unknot is zero because there is no crossing. And in fact, the unknot is the unknot if and only if there is no crossing. Okay. I hope that's reasonably clear. The crossing number of the trefoil, maybe this is a slightly better picture of the trefoil. The crossing number of the trefoil is three. I count three crossings. Good. To. Um, and the crossing number of whatever kind of knot is whatever it is. Then the crossing number of projection, in this case, the crossing number of the trefoil is indeed three. Okay. And how does hash behave with respect to number of crossings? Well, hash behaves almost perfect with respect to number of crossings. So the number of crossings of the hash is smaller or equal to the sum of the number of crossings. Let's do an example before we, so the, the, the number of crossings of this beast is lower or equal to the, the sum of those and this one here. Why is that? Well, this has three crossings. Uh, this has one, two, three, four crossings. If you just put them together, you still have the three crossings here and you still have the four crossings here. So whatever number you get, it's certainly smaller than three, smaller or equal to three plus four. I hope, hope that's reasonably clear, right? So you just put them together. You never touch the crossings neither on, on K nor on L, so the number can, cannot go up. If you count three on the left side and four, three and four on the left side, you count three plus four on the right-hand side. Okay. Um, let me just say that this is very likely to an inequality, but this is one of, so not theory, is full of, open, beautiful open questions, and this is one of the open questions. So this question stands now for 100 years or so, so uh, it's probably not so easy to, to solve, but it, it's kind of very likely that this is true, but we don't know. 
So the hash probably behaves very nicely um, with respect to the crossing. So mathematics is usually full of kind of open questions, and this is actually maybe the most important questions in, the question, open question in log theory. I don't know the answer, so I'm not going to do it. But let's, let's have a look how this actually works. Um, we're not fixed on equality, we're only fixed on a lower equal. All we ever need anyway. Okay. And the proof is k hash l has a projection with k plus l crossings. Well, can we do that again? Let me draw it again. So here's k, whatever it is, something crazy. k, and let's say k has small k number of crossings, and here's l, whatever it is, doesn't matter. l has small l number of crossings. And now I hash them together. Now, this is a bad color. Let me try maybe black. I hash them together here. So k hash l, k hash l has, well, k crossings and l crossings, right? So the cross of this beast is lower than k plus l because on the left hand side you have k and on the right hand side you have l. There could be some crazy simplifications that make the picture easier. That's why it's a lower equal and not an equal. And that's the whole difficulty of this um, open question here that I mentioned. But to just see that it's at most this number is not so difficult. You have k blue ones and you have l red ones. So you put them together very far away from any crossing. So you have k plus, you see k plus l uh, crossings for the, the hash. I hope that's, that's reasonably clear. Okay. In particular, we have a prime number factor. So here it really works. You have a prime number factorization for knots. Just the numbers are knots. Right? So you can write every knot as a hash of prime knots. So we can write every knot as a hash of prime knots. It's really beautiful now. So we now have a perfect prime number factorization. I will tell you in a second that this is like a really prime number factorization. So the prime knots that show up and their multiplicities are fixed by k as well. So this is really a prime number factorization. Remember that for surfaces, there was this silly, the Klein bottle is a torus type thing. You don't have anything like this here. So everything is kind of, kind of nice in this case. Okay. Um, let me try to now answer this question, which is essentially the last thing we do for today. So um, there are infinitely many knots. I showed you that. And you might ask, every knot is a factorization of prime knots. So a question that comes to mind is, how many prime knots are there, right? So are there five prime knots? Are there 10 or infinitely many? Um, so it seems to be a good question to ask, right? The, the first question people ask with prime numbers, kind of a very old kind of idea, is how many prime numbers are there? And there are infinitely many prime numbers. Uh, and there will be infinitely many prime knots in this case. So there's really almost a 100% analogy um, to multiplication of numbers. It's kind of very nice. Like knots behave a little bit like numbers. OK. In order to do this, I need to explain a certain class of knots. And it will turn out that they're always prime. So right now, we don't know any prime knot, actually. <laughs> but I will show you infinitely many. Right. So kind of the goal now is to prove the analog of their infinitely many prime numbers. So I would like to show you there are infinitely many prime knots. Okay. Um, and for two numbers, I write this funny symbol, three bars. So it's called, called congruent if um, they have the same fractional part. So if the difference is an integer. Okay. Fine. And I will draw a picture in a second. No, maybe let's just, let me just draw a picture immediately. So what I want to do is I want to put a knot on a torus. And whatever comes out, I call it torus knots. And there are two numbers involved. 
that's the, the number P and Q, how often I wind around the meridian and how often I wind around the, the longitude of the torus. So uh, if I draw a torus, and let me make a bit more space, if I draw a torus, like this one, I have two natural directions I can go around the torus. I can go around like this, or I can go around like this. And P and Q measure how often I go around like this, that's P, and how often I go around like this. Okay, the two numbers, how often I go around in one direction, how often I go around in the other direction on my little torus. So if I draw it on, um, on, on, on the usual presentation of the torus, remember this was a torus with an A and an A, if we glue them together, and a B and a B. This is a horrible choice of color, but I hope it's reasonably clear. So let me make this orange. Everyone likes orange. Okay. And I just draw a knot on a torus. I just draw lines on a torus. That's like drawing a knot on a torus. And I can go around, let's see, so two, I can go around two times in this direction and three times in this direction. So you see one, two, three here, and you see two here. And this winds around and this will close up into a string, like in, into a closed string, if and only if the greatest common divisor of P and Q is one. And I will, this guy is called the PQ torus knot. Now you go around P times in one direction and Q times in the other direction. And it will close up on the torus. So if you draw it on the torus, you get a knot that winds around uh, the torus. And you get this for every P and Q. For every pair, you need, you need them to close up. So ev for every pair, uh, like this. Okay. So here, 3, 2, 3, uh, 1, 2, 3. Three times around in the blue direction and two times around in the orange direction. So let me just make it orange. One, two. Well, orange is bad. To see. This is hard to see. Let me make it uh, again purple. One, two. Purple is not much better to see. Okay. So, and now you have P and Q, and you can go P times and Q times around in one of those directions. Okay. I have a slightly better picture for you. So there are two ways to go around um, the the torus. There's a longitude, the red line goes around the, the, the whole of the donut. So if you, if, okay, if you think of the, the torus as being a bagel or a donut, so you would cut, the, cut it as a bagel along the red line, and you would cut it as a donut along the black line if you want. So the other one is a meridian that goes around in this direction. And you can draw a curve that says gamma here in this picture, this little ugly Y type symbol. Uh, you can draw a curve on the torus by just winding around a certain number of times in, along the longitude and a certain number of times along the meridian. And this is called a torus knot. And it turns out that they're all different depending on P and Q. So we get a whole family of funny knots that just wind around um, the torus. Okay, so this one, for example, goes around the meridian three times. So here, one, two, three times. Again, one here, two here, and three times here. And it goes along the, uh, so three, and it goes along the longitude once, because it just goes around once. So this is three, one torus knot. Yeah, it's three times, one, two, and three. And it just goes around the, uh, the longitude once, because it just goes around once. OK, hope that makes some sense. So those numbers tell you how often you go around one of them. Remember the do donut versus bagel picture, depending how you uh, cut open the torus. Okay. Here's one that's a bit more complicated, 5, 7. So this goes 7 here, if you count. Let me not try to count, but anyway, and five here. And they will always close up. It goes five times around and seven times around in the other um, direction. You can do that for any pair of numbers, P and Q, with this condition. 
OK, and I'm going to skip this proof. It's kind of a little bit nasty, but I have it on the slides. So clearly, if I skip a proof, I won't ask it, right? So that's, that's, that's hopefully clear. Um, so all of these are prime knots. That's kind of uh, the point. So for any pair P and Q, they will always be prime. So you have infinitely many of them, because for, for every pair um, P and Q, you have those knots. OK, and I'm not going to prove this. Um, there are infinitely many uh, prime knots. Well, you can just take, for example, uh, P to be 2. So the crossing number of this beast uh, is the following. The crossing number of the torus knot, if you just count how often it goes around, you can convince yourself that it's P minus 1 times Q. So if you just take, for example, um, P to be 2, and they're all inequivalent because the number of crossings is Q, and you just have Q as a variable. Right? So if, if P is 2, the number of crossings is Q. So F, for every Q, you get a different torus knot, and every one of them is prime. So um, there are infinitely many primes. There are infinitely many prime knots. OK, this was a bad choice of color. Maybe uh, whatever. Ah, shit. Oh, anyway. <laughs> I can't grab it. I, I just it, it, it's to the out to the left of my PDF. So I can't grab it. Very, very annoying. Very annoying bug. Um, anyway, so I, ho I hope you can see uh, the purple here. Okay. So there are infinitely many primes, and I just showed you how to construct them. And if you remember, if you have seen the proof that there are infinitely many primes, it's essentially the same type of argument. You construct certain prime numbers. You definitely don't construct um, all prime numbers. We will run through the argument in a second again. And let me just um, pull up the number of knots. So there, there, there are many, many of them. As the number of prime knots starts off very harmless. Um, yeah, so one, zero, zero, one, one, two, three, seven, and then eventually it goes, goes just bonkers. So there, there are really, really many primes, many, many prime knots. So in this table, uh, the number of crossings is on the top and the number of prime knots is on the bottom. So they are, okay, whatever, 10,000 prime knots of, with 13, uh, 13 crossings. It's just a lot of them. So this is just, uh, let, let me now not do the same mistake again. Let me make it black. This is just a lot of those prime knots. And now every knot is some composition of them. So there are a lot of knots, as you can hopefully tell just from this table. So this number grows, grows, is really insane. It just grows very, very fast. It's only known up to whatever, something like 20 crossings. And afterwards, it's just nobody actually knows how many knots there are. Very good. I skipped the proof. The proof is annoying. Um, but let me just pull it up. Suppose that k is not the unknot, then there is a prime factorization. And this whole factorization is not invariant. So every factor, it's exactly like for the prime factorization. No matter how you do it, you will always end up up to uh, permutation. You will always end up up to shuffling them around. You will always end up with the same primes, with the same prime knots. So the whole thing is a knot invariant. As soon as you've decomposed your knots, you're essentially done. It's really the same as for numbers. And it's called prime factorization of knots. Very similar, prime factorization of numbers, prime factorization of knots, exactly the same statement. There's no difference, except that we lose using the, the funny hash symbol, which is kind of the only uh, difference here. Okay. I just decided to pull up a table of those, uh, the first 36 prime knots. Um, they're quite cute, as you can see. But there's a little bit of a mess, so we kind of need a, a better way to um, actually work with them. Okay, so let me do the torus once more. So the idea was, so what I showed you is the following. Um, back, 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 back. We have this operation that I call hash. Well, maybe this is a good, a good example of hash. We have an operation that I call hash, exactly the same as for the surfaces just glues two knots together, um, and it behaves exactly like a multiplication. So we have the, the whole notion of primes, of composite ones, we have a prime factorization, 
and all um, that fun stuff. And then what I did is I showed you um, the, uh, where is it? The, ah, come on. The infinitely many prime numbers. Yeah. So the infinitely many prime knots. And it's a bit tricky to construct them, but I showed you those, uh, the construction of those torus knots, which I can, oop, this is not what I wanted, which I can pull up again. So really just put something on a torus and just count how often you ride around uh, the, the longitude, so the, the way to cut, <laughs> to cut a bagel or the meridian if you ever want to cut your, uh, your donut. So just go around on, on the torus. These are those two numbers. And note that we can just swap them. I haven't said that. Maybe I should set that. So um, I have it here. If you think of um, this picture and you just um, take it yeah, and you can just um, rotate it. This should be a rotation. Ah, I want to rotate it. It doesn't work. Okay, fine. Um, so if you just take that picture and you rotate it, you can swap the roles of longitude and meridian. So let's say in this picture A is, is the meridian and B is the longitude. If I just rotate it, then B will be the meridian and A will be the longitude. So the, the, in particular, um, there's one relation among those knots, namely that PQ is the same as QP, just by rotating the torus, just by rotating the donut and changing what is meridian and what is longitude. But otherwise, they are always kind of different up to some silly coincidences. And for example, those guys uh, form the class of prime knots, right? So they have the number of crossings just being Q in this case. And then let's enjoy them once more. And then you see already uh, the vastness of knot theory. So let me just make a comparison now. In, for surfaces, we had the main statement about surfaces was the prime factorization of the surface into disks, um, tori, and projective planes. So we only had three different prime numbers. In knot theory, that's not the case. Knot theory is way closer to classical numbers where you have infinitely many primes. And there are just really a lot of them. Like this is a table of the first 36 of them. And they're, they're just really, really, where's my little? table, and there's just really, really a lot of them. So this number, hopefully, uh, in total, it should be just 36. And I just showed you everything up to eight crossings. So in, in, uh, in contrast to surfaces, where our main statement is just, this is the factorization, compute the factors, here it gets a bit much more difficult because there are infinitely many factors. So the correct strategy to follow in the final two lectures is not to force a statement of the form, given a not factor it into its prime factors, there's just too many prime factors. But the better strategy is to do what we have seen um, in, in the last video, uh, sorry, in the, in, the, in the last lecture, we, will, we need, really need more invariance of the form of, of a three coloring, which I just pulled up um, to end this lecture. So a three coloring uh, was a really beautiful and easy not invariant um, where all uh, three colors needed to be present. And let me just go a little bit further. And then you can just list the number of, oh, here you go. You can just list the number of three colorings. And it could convince yourself then, because it's an invariant, the number of three colorings is nine. So it can't be uh, the unknot. So what we need to do is we need to copy that strategy. So essentially, what I tried is I tried to copy the strategy from surfaces, but it fails because you get infinitely many objects you would need to check. That's a bit too much. Um, so we kind of need a better strategy, and I will show you a, a better strategy uh, like on Thursday and on Friday, and then we get two more not invariants. And essentially, in the exam, I will just ask you to compute them. They're, they're really not so uh, difficult to compute in the end. OK, thank you so much for coming today. <laughs>